All right. Greetings, everyone. Thank you for uh, the opportunity for uh, to conduct in class on machine learning based hardware trojan detection. So just before I start, I just wanted to make sure uh, everyone's able to hear me, able to see the slides. And yes. Uh, OK, perfect. All right. Thank you. So uh, I am Kevin Emmanuel Gubi. I am from uh, UC Davis. And uh, I will be taking the talk, um, will be taking the education class on behalf of uh, Professor Hoban Humayun, who's my advisor, and, and also uh, on behalf of Dr. Sohil Salehi. So uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm Kevin Manuel Kubi. I completed my master's from uh, San Francisco State University with Professor Hamid Mahmoudi. And it was in the topic of hardware security. And my master's thesis was titled Secure Obfuscated Hardware Using ARM Trust Zone, uh, where uh, we used, where I used logic locking to secure an IP and uh, provide extra safeguards using ARM Trust Zone. And currently I'm a PhD student at University of California, Davis uh, with uh, Professor Human Humayun and Professor Vesta Sasan. And again, my focus is hardware security and machine learning hardware design. So the focus of this talk will be ASIC hardware security. Uh, we'll go through the ASIC supply chain, the IC supply chain, the ASIC uh, design flow, and then introduction to hardware security and, and then hardware trojans. And we'll follow up with uh, a machine learning based hardware trojan detection example. Right? And so we'll go through ASIC specific hardware security. Although there are FPGA firmware and other types of hardware security, I will be focusing on ASIC uh, hardware security. All right. So, um, so to start off with, let's go through the IC supply chain. And of course, we start with the IP design. We have uh, uh, the IP design house, where the, which is the first, um, the first part of your IC supply chain. And your design house can uh, specify your IC uh, specifications and can design your the IC using third-party IPs or in-house design team or uh, an integration team. And uh, the end product of this stage is the RTL netlist. So uh, I just wanted to give an introduction to the IC supply chain and uh, IC design for uh, people who aren't um, familiar with the field. So we can later understand hardware security concepts. So for the uh, for IC design, hardware description language is used to uh, describe how a design should behave. And for example, um, let's take this uh, full ladder here. We have the full ladder and uh, the full ladder can be described in very VHDL by this simple code snippet, right? And once uh, this RTL is given to the uh, backend, you have various stages that the design flows through. And first, the RTL is verified. And then you have DFT planning, you have synthesis, you have flow planning, you have standard cell placement, clock tree synthesis routing verification, timing analysis, power integrity, and many more steps that are, uh, are used in the industry. So once the RTL design, RTL netlist is complete, it's given to the backend or the synthesis and verification, and then to the physical design. So synthesis is a simple process where you take a behavioral code and convert it and transform it into a hardware description uh, netlist. So this is done by various tools. One of those uh, very popular tool is uh, Synopsys Design Compiler. And um, you need various inputs to this tool. Uh, one, of that, one of those inputs um, can be your design libraries, your constraint files, and a 
a lot of other files to uh, as input. And once you uh, synthesize the design, the de design is synthesized in terms of those logical libraries. Then you go through a step of equivalence. Equivalence, equivalence is nothing but checking your uh, checking if both your behavioral and your functional and uh, structural uh, so, um, designs are the same. And then you go into physical design, which first step of which is floor planning, where you place macros, you place uh, standard cells, you plan out the floor plan of the chip, and then you start placing these uh, IPs, macros, or standard cells. So once your flow planning uh, is done and you start placing these cells, you uh, iteratively start uh, arranging these macros and then standard cells and then uh, I IPs onto the chip area, which is then uh, taken to the clock tree synthesis step where you have the clock tree is generated. And this clock tree is, um, is basically uh, provides the clock signal to all of your registers and make sure, make sure that makes sure that your each register is synchronized with uh, every other register on the chip. So you have a lot of different methods to distribute the clock tree to make sure the clock tree is synchronized, which we won't go into, but uh, um, there are a lot of methods that uh, are implemented in clock tree synthesis to make sure your clock tree is well distributed and synchronized. The next step is routing. Uh, once uh, your placement is done, your routing of si signals is and power is done. And once your routing is done, your chip is almost complete, you have your equivalence again done, you have your verification, and then you run through static timing analysis, which is uh, essentially checking if there are any violations, set up a whole violations or any other violations that might later on, once you manufacture, manufacture the chip, produce uh, an error or make the chip fail. Right? So once all of these uh, checks are done, the, the sign-off checks are done, uh, you, the design house um, produces G, the GDS2 file. So the GDS2 file is the current, the current industry standard that is sent to the fabrication unit for manufacturing. So once the GDS is produced, it is sent as a file to the fabrication unit and the fabrication uh, facility uses the GDS2 file uh, to generate uh, to generate uh, layers of the IC and uh, tape out the chip. So the fabrication, uh, the foundry accepts the GDS2 from the physical design house and then takes it through a complex uh, sequence of steps and then gives out the fabricated IC. And then you have a step of post-silicon IC testing where you test the chip that is fabricated in the foundry by either a third party or the design house, and you make sure that uh, test chips are working. And then you have packaging and assembly where you uh, uh, connect your uh, package, uh, connect your chip to your PCB and to your package and so on. Um, you also have uh, 2.5D and 3D uh, integration nowadays and various methods to uh, integrate these uh, packages. So, oh, let me just reshare my screen. So. Okay, so I'll just so, yeah. So the man uh, once you have uh, the manufactured ICs, um, you use them, uh, you assemble them, and you 
integrate them onto your PCB boards, you solder the ICs, you uh, add the capacitances, inductors, and build a system. So once you have the system, your product is shipped to the market. Now, this is the basic uh, IC supply chain. Now, a good understanding of the IC supply chain is necessary to understand the vulnerabilities of hardware security uh, in the IC, in through the process. So um, the IC supply chain as now uh, due to globalization has uh, moved to different uh, parts of the world, different countries uh, contribute uh, to verification, different countries contribute to design, physical design. So the same chip can, uh, uh, can be um, developed by several countries at the same time due to the globalization of manufacturing. And this is um, a huge factor uh, for productivity and manufacturability of uh, ICs. However, there is a security uh, threat. So in the past, uh, usually when we discuss computer security or cyber security vulnerabilities, we're mainly concerned about malware um, or other uh, software, uh, malicious software. And we relied on a hardware to be root of trust. Uh, that is, uh, which essentially means that your underlying hardware is secure and trusted. Unfortunately, that cannot be the case as, as we'll see that your hardware root of trust can now be breached by third parties and adversaries. And no more is your uh, hardware secure and trusted. Uh, you'll have to build secure hardware to make sure you have a secure root of trust and in turn secure system. The main cause of this is an untrusted uh, supply chain. So although the supply chain, ideally would we would like uh, the supply chain to be trusted, it is essential to understand the IC supply chain and the possible vulnerabilities and the threats to safeguard IP from theft and prevent adversaries uh, from tampering with the IC. As, as you can see that there are various uh, steps and various uh, segments in which ICs can be tampered with or uh, adversaries can gain access to ICs. So let's go through the different hardware security uh, threats. So let's um, go through the very uh, few well-known hardware security threats, uh, one of which is counterfeiting. So the threat of the threat of counterfeiting has been an age-old threat where you have different ICs being manufactured, being counterfeited by different foundries, and they are made to look as similar to the original IC as possible. And due to um, as as um, you can you have like various uh, advanced uh, scanning um, scanning uh, methods and tools, you uh, adversaries are able to uh, reverse engineer your IC and produce the exact same IC with the exact same uh, packaging, uh, and they're able to make it look exactly similar to the original IC. So this um, happens usually in a recycling center, for example, and once the PCBs are taken to uh, taken off, the ICs are taken off, and then these ICs are again refined and recycled and sold as new ICs. And these ICs may be used in critical applications, um, and the design house might assume, or the application uh, user might assume that the IC is new. However, the IC might be uh, old and might malfunction a lot sooner than expected. So another threat is IP piracy, where you have um, different IPs. And uh, for example, uh, an ARM IP can be uh, sold at a lower price in the black market. And um, that is IP piracy. You have the a confidential IP being sold um, by a adversary, by a malicious person to uh, different entities without the knowledge of the design house. 
So this is another big threat that the IC industry is dealing with. And the, another threat is IC overuse where uh, the IC design, the GDS2 is sent to the foundry and the foundry is uh, supposed to manufacture, let's say 100 ICs. However, there's a um, adversary in the, in the foundry and the adversary manufactures 50 extra ICs. And the design house does not know that there are 150 ICs in total. So the extra 50 ICs are sent uh, are used as sold by the adversary for profit and um, the market share of the design house is cut uh, the, uh, due to the extra uh, number of ICs that could have been sold but uh, were uh, overused. So and another key threat is reverse engineering again due to advanced uh, scanning electron microscopes and advanced technology. Uh, adversary, adversaries are able to take an IC, depackage and de-layer de the whole uh, IC layer by layer, scan the IC, uh, IC, IC layers, and then extract the uh, netlist from the IC. And all of this, although it needs a lot of initial investment, it can can be done uh, pretty easily with uh, state-of-the-art uh, reverse engineering tools. And uh, currently, there are a lot of uh, reverse engineering tools that uh, that are being used. And uh, I see reverse engineering is a huge problem for the semiconductor industry. And side channel attacks is a very common uh, attack. Uh, a common threat that's well known and has been uh, in the research domain for a long time. You have uh, secure computing, you have a compute system where uh, you're, for example, you have an embedded computing hardware and the cryptography keys are encrypted. And however, just by looking at the power read, read currents or power, you can extract valuable data which essentially can break the cryptographic system. So, and then we have hardware trojans. So the topic of this talk is hardware trojans. So hardware trojans are basically uh, malicious modifications to a circuit to control, modify, disable, or monitor its logic, right? So the use of untrusted entities in this global supply chain has raised pressing concerns about the security of fabricated ICs. And these ICs that are targeted for sensitive applications um, can, be in, can be induced with hardware trojans. And one of these security threats is, um, again, infestation of hardware trojans through the IC supply chain. And uh, we'll take a look at a few different examples of hardware trojan uh, next. So again, we looked at uh, IC supply chain and we looked at ASIC security. There is also FPGA security. We won't go through it uh, too much, but uh, although we know that FPGAs are basically a grid of um, LUTs that, uh, that can be mapped uh, later in field, there's a question that can FPGAs uh, be attacked? Are FPGAs secure? So FPGAs are not, designed for any specific application as uh, a lot of you might know. And reverse engineering and FPGA simply might not reveal anything because only after the bitstream is loaded into the FPGA, you can attain valuable information. So are there hardware, are there hardware challenges associated with FPGAs? Yes, there are a lot of hardware challenges associate, associated with FPGAs. Uh, one of them is, uh, if you have an offshore foundry, the fabrication facility that receives the GDS2 um, generated mask files and fabricated um, and the fabricated base array, the untrusted foundry can engage in malicious modification of the base array itself of the FPGA or IP theft or insert a hardware trojan in the base array of the FPGA. Another uh, aspect is um, programs features, uh, program features 
vectors or configurations of an FPGA can be modified um, by simply attacking the bit stream. Right? So you have a bit stream that is intended to be uh, um, sent to the FPGA and adversely takes the bit stream, modifies the bit stream, maybe inserts a hardware torsion in the bit stream, FPGA bit stream, and then sends it to the FPGA. And uh, once the FPGA is, uh, the bit stream is loaded, the FPGA essentially is um, compromised. So as you can see in the slide, you have various um, attack vectors for FPGAs too. So this is also a research topic uh, to look into. Another very press, uh, another very pressing FPGA security uh, aspect is currently with cloud security. You have uh, cloud servers that uh, cloud providers that have FPGAs uh, for uh, as a service, and they allow two different entities, for example, uh, company A and company B to access the same FPGA. And company A can essentially plant a sensor on the FPGA to snoop on company B's uh, design on the same FPGA. So you have multi-tenancy issue where mul multiple tenants use the same FPGA and data, data can be leaked or the design can be leaked. So there are a lot of issues which uh, also can be looked at uh, uh, in FPGA research. So this is a basic com uh, comparison between ASIC flow and FPGA flow uh, and how is reverse engineering done and is Trojan insertion possible? How is it done? And you have uh, IP cloning. How is it done uh, in ASIC and FPGA? So, so Coming back to the IC supply chain, uh, these are the different vulnerabilities. You have IP piracy and counterfeiting, but thankfully we also have a countermeasure, right? So logic locking or logic obfuscation has been uh, proved, uh, proven to um, secure an IP against uh, IP piracy, counterfeiting by simply replacing selected gates with lookup tables right, or other logic. So, and these circuits would function as intended only with the correct key. So you have a necklist, essentially you have a chip and only if a correct key is inserted into those key logic, your chip is will function as intended or is unlocked only with the right key. So another threat, as we've seen as hardware trojan insertion and uh, machine learning based hardware trojan detection is uh, the upcoming, uh, the current area of research that's being done and has been proven to detect uh, malicious hardware trojans uh, inserted into ICs. And there's also another area of research that we we're looking into where site channel analysis can be used to maliciously mo monitor site side channel signals from an IC. As you can see here, the bottom right, you can see each function has a different read current. And just by looking at the read currents, you can, you can obtain which uh, function is being performed. So this is uh, not uh, desirable. And I ideally, we like to not leak any information. But that's highly, uh, highly difficult. It's a difficult task to uh, perform. So we have various uh, side channel attack mitigation techniques using emerging memories, using uh, MTJs, magnetic, well, magnetic tunnel uh, junctions, STTM RAMs, RAMs, and various methods uh, um, by, for example, masking uh, that can be used to mitigate side channel uh, attacks. So in comes machine learning. So you have all of these um, various um, um, hardware security vulnerabilities. You have a lot of data associated with this. Uh, and machine learning has uh, been proven to uh, give breakthroughs in a lot of domains, especially in genomics and 
uh, uh, medical sciences. So machine learning, if used in the right uh, aspect, can can be really useful for hardware security too. So here's a simple classification or taxonomy of machine learning algorithms. And I have divided it into four different methods, uh, four different classes, let's say. So supervised learning, semi-supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. Although reinforcement learning can be put into one of these, I've separated it into uh, another uh, class. So we won't be going into uh, the in-depth into, into the algorithms, but we'll see how machine learning can be used to detect hardware trojans and used for hardware security. Right? So just to get, give you an overhead overview of uh, uh, how machine learning has has been integrated into hardware security. Let's look at a timeline of uh, hardware design for trust mechanisms. Uh, so over the years, there have been many design for trust mechanisms, that is uh, mechanisms that have uh, improved the design secure, security and trust. For example, watermarking, IC metering, IC camouflaging, split manufacturing, and logic locking. Right? All of these are used to um, are used to secure an IC against various uh, hardware security th threats, and so all of these essentially were uh, proposed to reimagine the trust in silicon. Right? How how can a company say how can a uh, design house say that their silicon is proprietary only to them and does not have any hardware trojans, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Um, all of these attacks, all of these uh, defenses were uh, proposed. However, recent um, introduction of SAT attack uh, uh, in the year 2015, um, SAT attack, Boolean satisfiability uh, has been around for a while, but Boolean satisfiability attack against logic locking was proposed in 2015. And that opened the door for a lot more attacks and defenses. So um, all of these are logic locking attacks. The ones in green are defenses. The ones in red are attacks. So later on, close um, closer to uh, 2000, uh, 2017, 2018, 2019, and on, you have a lot of machine learning based uh, at attacks and defenses. So as you can see on the bottom left, there's a there's an attack called GNN unlock. So where they use graph neural networks to uh, break logic locking, and then you have SMT attack, you have interlock, you have uh, full lock, you have glitch and leak, you have a lot of different attacks that attacks and defenses that use machine learning, especially after 2017, 18. And these have been proven to uh, further the research in hardware security. So again, let's come back to the IC supply chain and uh, let's look at the vulnerabilities in the IC supply chain from a hardware trojan uh, insertion perspective. So if you look at this hard, uh, IC supply chain, you have uh, you have your specification and then your RTL design. So hardware torsions can be inserted at your RTL stage. Maybe a hardware torsion can be inserted through a third-party IP vendor. For example, let's say we have uh, a design house that borrows or buys a third-party IP from another design house. And unknowingly, the, the uh, IP has uh, a hardware trojan in it, and the design house integrates the hardware trojan infested IC into their uh, SOC. And once that is done, your hardware trojan is in, inserted right at the RTL stage, which is very early, and uh, it gets integrated into the design, and that is very difficult to detect at test and the later on stages. So you have a uh, third party IP, uh, which is a threat. And then you have in-house design teams. However, you can have 
uh, rogue designers, like who by chance uh, go rogue and insert hardware trojans. So this also is an issue for uh, hardware security. How do you keep your netlist secure from hardware trojans? And how do you keep monitoring your netlist as it goes through each and every stage? Uh, and how do you monitor it for hardware trojans? And although this might seem pretty simple on in this figure, in uh, actual companies, you have like multiple iterations of uh, verification, multiple iterations of uh, placement routing, physical design, uh, a validation. So it keeps changing hands. That is the IT, uh, IP netlist keeps changing hand pretty often. And through this whole process, there are a lot of opportunities for uh, adversaries to insert hardware trojans. And another attack vector is third-party EDA tools. So you have, uh, for example, uh, um, an EDA tool by a certain company, which uh, by a certain adversarial company, let's say uh, company X is providing the design house with an EDA tool. Now the EDA tool is, is usually never checked if it is, uh, if it is uh, benign or malicious. So usually the design house just uses the EDA tool, gets the license and starts using the EDA tool. Now, what if the hardware Trojan, there was a hardware Trojan script in the EDA tool that inserted hardware Trojans some, somewhere during the design process. So it is a stealthy way of inserting hardware Trojans. That is using a third party EDA tool to insert hardware Trojans. So these are the few vectors, few known vectors, and there may be a lot of other vectors that are unknown or uh, unknown to the design house, but uh, might still be used for insertion of hardware Trojans. And research uh, interest is to find those unknown vectors and pr um, produce defenses against them. So again, once you have your hardware trojan infested netlist and once that is sent to the fabrication unit it is essentially stitched onto your ic that is it is integrated onto your ic and it is very difficult to mitigate so it's very difficult to remove or prevent and there are very few uh methods that uh prevent or detect hardware trojans after fabrications so this is also an interesting research topic. How do you mitigate hardware trojans after they have been inserted into your netlist and your chip has been manufactured? So hardware trojans, although they are, uh, they might be pretty big. It's usually uh, undetectable by regular testing. That's uh, that's usually how hardware tro uh, trojans are designed. So. So usually the con conventional manufacturing uh, test and verification methodologies, they fall short in detecting hardware trojans due to different and unmodeled nature of these uh, malicious alterations. So this has basically led many researchers to investigate solutions for detection of hardware trojans through a lot of different methods. One could be statistic analysis of site channel information collected from ICs, and another could be uh, using site channel power analysis. Another method could be using site channel uh, power supply transient signal analysis. And uh, another method of corrosion detection could be uh, uh, supply current analysis, temperature analysis, wireless transmission power analysis, and site channel delay analysis. That is uh, assessing the delay to find out hardware torsions uh, in the IC. So here's a um classification of hardware trojans and there can be more than one adversary for a hard uh, for a trojan threat model that is you can have multiple hardware trojan uh, attack vectors and multiple hardware trojans in the same ic so uh the adversary can get very creative and insert multiple hardware trojans and um uh, try to be as stealthy and deceptive as possible to trick the uh, design team or the hardware trojan 
uh, security testing. So as you can see on the screen, you have uh, uh, different classifications of hardware trojans based on different uh, methods of insertion, different abstraction levels, for example, like some hardware trojans are inserted at the physical level, some hardware trojans are inserted in the gate level or RTL level, and some uh, trojans are inserted at the system level. And again, insertion phase, which phase of the IC supply chain is your hardware trojan inserted? And then you have activation mechanism where it's always on or it's triggered internally, or is it time-based? Is it a ticking time bomb uh, kind of hardware torsion? Is it condition-based? Is it external? And you have all of these different uh, classifications of uh, hardware torsions. So um, basic terminology on hardware torsion is, uh, is shown here. So you have uh, the, uh, the adversary. So the adversary is goal uh, is to insert a hardware trojan and make sure the hardware trojan does not get triggered easily, but rather get trig gets triggered at a very rare e event. And the goal of the design house is to detect the hardware trojan by different methods or triggering that rare event. Right? So a hardware trojan consists of um, three main components and um, a Trojan trigger input, which is TP, the Trojan uh, Trojan's triggering circuit or TTC, and then the Trojan payload, TP. Right? So you have three basic components that we have coined. You have the Trojan trigger, which is the input to the Trojan. Then you have the Trojan triggering circuit or TC or TPC. And then you have the Trojan payload, which is the actual Trojan that gets latched onto the circuit or gets removed from the circuit, TP. So your Trojan trigger is essentially uh, the inputs that are connected from, for example, a victim net to your uh, Trojan triggering circuit. So your Trojan triggering circuit is essentially monitoring, uh, could be monitoring these victim nets and as soon as you have a certain input to the Trojan trigger, your Trojan payload is let into the circuit or dropped onto the circuit. That is, your hardware Trojan is activated. So in the second box, you can, the hardware activation circuit type, you can see there are two hard, uh, activation types that's provided here. So one is purely combinational, and then the other is sequential. So the one on the left is combinational, where you're looking for a certain input, like maybe one zero, or all ones, or 32 uh, bit one. And once you get that input, your hardware trojan is triggered. Meanwhile, on the right, you have a sequential uh, hardware trojan, where you're looking for a series of, or sequence of rare events. So for example, you have one, one, uh, 32 bit one, 10 uh, for 10 clock cycles. If only if that sequence is encountered, your hardware trojan, trojan is triggered. And so your uh, tri trojan trigger is, uh, once your trojan trigger is activated, your trojan payload upon activation is, is either attached to the circuit or alters the circuit's functionality. And the common assumption is that the Trojan is inserted in all fabricated ICs. That is uh, the way of testing or the mindset of testing is to make sure that you test each and every fabricated IC for hardware Trojans. You cannot, it's best not to assume that hardware Trojans, uh, there aren't any hardware Trojans. So let's look at an example of hardware trojan. Uh, so a simple bypass hardware trojan uh, can bypass a cryptographic hardware, which could be used to encrypt uh, data on your phone, for example. So the adversary uh, could be somewhere in the supply chain, and they have inserted a trojan controlled by uh, controlled 
uh, a Trojan control bypass mechanism. So essentially what happens is based on a sequence, a sequence of ladder events or combinational uh, events, um, the Trojan trigger activates the pay payload. And in this example on the bottom, you can see that the cryptographic hardware is essentially bypassed. So if a data or confidential data was supposed to be encrypted, once the hardware Trojan is triggered, it essentially bypasses the encryption phase and you have your plain text or your um, unprotected or un unencrypt unencrypted text uh, in memory. So this can be read by uh, the adversary and can be used for malicious uh, intentions. So another example of a hardware Trojan is uh, uh, this provider on the right. You have a missile control system and uh, we, an assumption is that the control uh, is remote and radio frequency uh, RF channel is used for communication. So all the messages are sent in encrypted form and after decryption, if the message is received uh, and authenticated, the uh, fired missile is detonated. And the adversary um, has designed and essentially ins inserted a hardware Trojan in this circuit. And uh, the control systems receive a encrypted command uh, from an RF channel. And that command is stored in register. And if this isn't verify, this could come from any source. So if it comes from the adversary and the adversary transmits a hardware Trojan code that causes activation of the missile, that causes catastrophic consequences. So uh, this is a very sensitive application and hardware Trojans are of great interest to uh, these kind of applications, which are high, highly sensitive and critical. So let's look at very uh, the very early um, detection methods of hardware trojans. So you have uh, the very few uh, very first few papers. Uh, you have hardware trojan uh, detection using path delay. So in order to in order to get a low cost but effective hardware trojan detection method, what uh, they have done is uh, they've done they've complemented traditional testing methods. Um, with a new behavioral or oriented category uh, method. So they proposed the paper, they proposed to divide Trojans into two categories, explicit uh, payload Trojan and implicit payload Trojan. And this categorize, categorization method take, makes it uh, possible to construct Trojan models and then lower the cost of uh, testing. So uh, path delays of nominal, nominal chips are collected to construct a series of fingerprints. and each one, uh, uh, each one aspect of the total characteristics of uh, a genuine design is used and the chips are valid. The rest of the chips are validated by comparing the delay fingerprints, delay parameters to the fingerprint of a Trojan free IC. So and another very popular Trojan detection uh, framework is Miro. Uh, they propose a test pattern generation technique based on multiple excitation of rare logical conditions at internal nodes. Uh, such, a, such a statistic uh, approach maximizes the probability of inserted Trojans getting triggered and detected by logical testing. So while drastically uh, reducing the number of vectors compared to the weighted random pattern uh, based test generation. So another paper is uh, uses time to activate or reduces the time to activate a hardware Trojan circuit. And this is a major concern, right? So you have um, your, uh, from the authentication standpoint, time to activate a hardware Trojan must be as low as possible. So this paper analyzes uh, the time to generate a transition in functional Trojans and uh, Transition is modeled by geometric distribution and the number of clock cycles required to generate a transmission is essentially estimated here. So they also insert a dummy scan flip-flop uh, uh, 
they proposed this method in um, in order to decrease the transition generation time. And this is another uh, paper, legacy paper. So we have uh, different uh, machine learning hardware trojan detection methods. You have uh, uh, from 2017, you have various machine learning based hardware trojan detection methods. And after machine learning was made accessible and easy to implement by tools and libraries like TensorFlow, PyTorch, Keras, et cetera, there has been a boom of uh, machine learning based hardware security papers. And here's a list of papers. We'll go through a couple papers. So uh, one of uh, one popular paper is called Hero, and they uh, present a holistic approach to the problem of hardware trojan detection. And they propose a pipeline that demonstrates a unique potential in hardware uh, identifying hardware trojans. They do this by combining multimodal data coming from different stages of the IC manufacturing process. So apart from their innovate, uh, the innovation that's done here, um, they also focus on a future project vision uh, and they present the main steps required for scaling up the, the hero technology readiness level, uh, as well as um, the plans for commercializing uh, comm commercialization of this technology. Uh, the uh, HERO uh, pipeline is applied at each data source, as you can see on the uh, in the figure. And uh, the proposed uh, uh, HERO approach is uses deep learning to uh, get in the inputs from side channel analysis, place and route, and gate level networks to give you a detection result. So another example is uh, uh, machine learning um, in in machine learning hardware torsion detection is uh, GNN for TJ, uh, which uses graph neural networks for hardware. So essentially, what they do is they address the limitations of hardware uh, detection solutions. So the shortcomings are one of the biggest shortcomings of hardware torsion detection methods is the reliance of a golden reference and the unable uh, un the um uh, the reliance of a golden ic is uh, is good as long as you are able to manufacture your ic in a trusted foundry but if you do not have a trusted foundry uh, reliance on this golden reference is essentially not feasible so uh, Another uh, shortcoming is the limited detection scope uh, for some type of hardware trojans. And the detection is not scalable or it's too complex. So what the paper has produced or uh, uh, proposed is a new golden reference free pre-silicon hardware trojan detection method that learns the circuit behavior and identifies the hardware trojans due to their malicious behavior. And uh, since hardware is non uh, is non-Euclidean, uh, structural type of data in nature. We use uh, graph, um, like we can use graph uh, data as a great match for hardware representation. And then um, you can generate data flow graphs or DFGs as stated in this paper for RTL codes. And then um, you can leverage the uh, graph neural networks to model the behavior of the circuit. And uh, again, all of these research is very interesting, but to start with hardware trojan, re trojan research, one popular research or resource is uh, Trust Hub. So Trust Hub is a very popular uh, resource, um, and for ASIC uh, level uh, chip trojans, you can uh, go to the website. You can uh, under benchmarks, you can go to chip level trojans, and then you can uh, get. Uh, a lot of uh, the chip level trojan benchmarks from this website and a few examples for example um, um, a few examples from the website you have aes t18800 and essentially this uh, hardware trojan uh, drains the battery of a device and if uh, if 
used in a medical uh, implant device, for example, the battery uh, is very important. So if this hard retrogen is triggered, the medical appliance loses its battery uh, pretty quickly. Another hard retrogen is called AEST2 uh, T2000. And uh, this hard retrogen can leak secrets of the AES128 uh, through leakage current. And uh, you can download this and you can integrate this into your circuit for uh, uh, detection testing. Another, uh, another uh, hardware trojan is the RS232 uh, T500. And this hardware trojan is uh, essentially a 32 bit counter inserted in uh, the transmitter uh, of the UART uh, module. So essentially, the counter is increased by one every clock cycle. And when the counter reaches the highest uh, possible uh, digit, that is 32 bit one, it gets activated and it uh, a certain signal is set to zero, which essentially breaks the circuit. So uh, this is the fourth example of a hard retrogen. You have uh, a T100 and essentially the hard retrogen enables the scan um, enable off a scan chain. And this essentially, essentially can leak information when the chip is in functional mode, which ideally shouldn't happen. So this is another example of a hardware torsion. So there are key challenges in ASIC hardware torsion detection and uh, the uh, uh, triggering uh, input of a hardware torsion poses a uh, additional uh, capacitive load on the driving circuit, and uh, a torsion can be detected by tracking, analyzing, and uh, analyzing the changes in delay, for example, and compared to that of uh, predicted by the static timing analysis. So the challenge um, for hardware torsion uh, detection. The key challenges in ASIC hardware torsion detection are process variation, process drift, and voltage noise. So these are the key challenges that uh, prevent uh, or hamper with your torsion detection. So let's look into voltage noise. So in an ASIC chip, the power delivery network or the PDN is essentially a RLC network that responds to the change in current demands of transistors, which poses a voltage drop. And voltage variation uh, on transistor also occurs due to the uh, RLC network. Now, during STA, the IR drop and voltage noise are modeled by two things. One is specifying a rail voltage below the supplied voltage to account for IR drop. And the second is using register endpoint uncertainty to guard against voltage variation induced clock network jitter. So the chosen values for the rail voltage and uncertainty should be pessimistic to capture the worst case, that is to prevent setup and hold failure. However, in majority of the timing path, uh, paths experienced, smaller IR drop and voltage no uh, uh, noise is usually the case. So although you, you have, uh, you would like to have pessimistic or worst case uh, um, values chosen for your rail voltage and uncertainty in order to prevent setup and hold failure. Most of the timing parts experience much uh, smaller IR drops and voltage noise. So um, having such a um, large margin is not necessary. So this essentially poses a security threat. The, uh, pessimistic margins build large unused time timing slack into the majority of timing paths, uh, which is not visible to the physical designer and the test engineer. Now, the unused timing slacks can be used by an adversary in an untrusted foundry to design a Trojan and hide its delay impact. So essentially, uh, an adversary can hide a Trojan stealthily just by using the unused timing slack. And 
during static timing analysis or testing by the test engineer or physical designer, the hardware trojan is never detected because it's still within the timing, uh, within the uh, pessimistic timing margins that's that was introduced. Now, the second uh, challenge is process variation. So process variation refers to the variation in physical and electrical properties of transistors in the result of physical limitations faced during the fabrication process. So it affects the delay and drive strength of fabricated transistors. And process variation makes tro trojan detection more difficult as one has to investigate if the change in delay is a result of process variation or timing and impact of a hardware trojan. So a change in delay can can be can arise due to the fact that uh, your hardware trojan has been inserted or triggered, or it could simply be process variation. So this makes it very difficult for hardware trojan detection uh, methodologies to differentiate be between process variation based uh, delay that is process variation induced delay versus hardware trojan induced delay. The third, uh, the third main challenge is that the SPICE model for the fabrication process in a new technology node is released soon after a process, uh, a process node is production ready and is essentially used to characterize the standard cell libraries deployed in physical design house. Now, to guarantee the high yield, the SPICE model and standard cell libraries are padded with a carefully ma crafted margin. Now, this margin um, is uh, has, again, has uh, pessimistic uh, margins. That is, you have additional uh, margins to account for various process variations and process trick. And in addition, the foundry keeps improving the process over time to increase yield.